Oh, good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. We are continuing on in our, our study of the fabulous book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, to those of you watching at home, um, I hope you're enjoying this as well. Be sure and download the, hand, the handout and the homework. Um, and it, for the class, again, the homework is not graded. I don't question you on it. It's designed for you to go back in to help you think and ponder over some of the things we've read and heard in the lesson. And if you have somebody you can discuss those homework questions with, even better. Um, if, if it's somebody that you happen to be living with in your home, that's the best. But if not, because I've got a lot of single folks in here, and you've got a friend in the church, well, that's, those homework questions are kind of designed for you to go in and talk about and really go in and, and bring these lessons home. Because we can do Sunday school here. And that's simple. It's getting it in here that becomes the difficult part. And that's kind of what that homework stuff is designed to do. So with that, enough, enough uh, promoting the, the homework stuff. Um, but... Do, do consider looking at those questions over, over the course of the week. Uh, Dana, would you open us this morning? Christian, sure. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you that we can come into your, your church, Father. That we are your church. The church is not this building. It's you living inside, living inside of each one of us, Father. Father, as we listen to the words of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes from the wisest man you created, Solomon. Father, let us take that in, Father, even though it sometimes it just feels like, wow, this guy's got a sad story to tell. He's just explaining to us that life is meaningless without you. So, Father, as we go into the worship hour, Father, always lift our hearts and our minds to you, Father, and as we go throughout the rest of this week, allow us to be bold and to stand for who you are. Because the world needs Jesus, Father, that's why he came. All these things I ask in your name. Amen. Well, I, I titled this lesson, as you see on, on your handout, well, hello, McGaffrey. McGaffrey, I, I don't need you today. <laughs> yeah, McGaffrey, you know, yeah, it's a big part of Come back, thank you. Uh, but I titled this week's Timing is Everything. And most of you have become aware of that in life. You can do something at one time and it's perfectly fine. You do it just slightly different, a different day, a different hour, and it's all, it's all wrong. Um, and we're going to kind of look at that a little bit today. But let's go back and review last week first. What was Solomon's hypothesis that he put out right at the beginning of chapter 2. He said, he's going to get a hypothesis. Here's my idea, and then I'm going to examine it. What was his hypothesis? Does pleasure give an adequate justification for human existence? Yeah, is, is pleasure, mm -hmm. does that the thing, is that why I exist? To be happy. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people that think that's why, you know, does it make me happy? Mm -hmm. And of course, he kind of answered that and said, nope. Because at the end of the day, whether you've had all your happy moments or not, where do you end up? You end up in the same place. He said, that's not an adequate reason for my existence either. He then compared, also we saw last week, that he compared wisdom to what? Light. Light. What is it about light? What does light do for us? Shows the light. The Removes the darkness. Removes the darkness. Let you see things. Absolutely. And do you remember what the definition of wisdom was from week one? Oh, yeah, now I'm testing you. You can't look at your notes from last week. <laughs> no? Although that is, <laughs> that is wisdom. But kind of just for working that is taking knowledge and doing the right thing with it. Wisdom is the application of knowledge, the correct application. <laughs> And he said, wisdom is like light. Wisdom allows you to see things so you can make the good decisions. We also saw last week, and this is a big one, and, and I know you all have run into this in your life as well. Fools 
are always what by things that happen to them. Surprise. Fools are always surprised by what happens to them. How did this happen to me? Well, um, <laughs> let me explain it to you. When you do stupid stuff, stupid stuff happens. Yeah, I used to. I used to explain that to criminals all the time. When you do bad <laughs> stuff, people like me show up. That's just kind of the the way things work. But they're always surprised by the silly things that happen to them when they make foolish decisions. And Solomon figured out that the meaning to life wasn't found in what four things? And these are the same four things that people are looking to make meaning out of their lives now. What four things did Solomon say, this does not give you the meaning to life? Pleasure, wealth, power, and Pleasure, wealth, power, and even wisdom. <clears throat> because Solomon, the wisest person that ever lived, where did he end up? In the grave with the stupid people. <laughs> so he, said, he figured out that even wisdom itself didn't give that meaning to life. And so on kind of that happy note, we're going to go into Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is the best known chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes. People who don't know the book of Ecclesiastes, who have never read it, recognize this. But hold on to that for a minute. Let's talk about this whole timing thing. Because... Way too often we confuse God's timing and ours. And we want our timing and God's timing to be the same thing. In fact, there's a lot of times we pray and tell God what his timing needs to be. Right. I need you to do this, you know, right now. A country newspaper, and this is not the newspaper, this is just a generic picture of an old newspaper. A country newspaper had been running a series of articles on the value of church attendance back in the times when, church, when newspapers might actually do that. So you know how old the article was. <laughs> One day, a letter to the editor was received in the newspaper office, and it read, Print this if you dare. I have been trying an experiment. An experiment. I have a field of corn, and I plowed that field on Sunday. I planted it on a Sunday. I did all the cultivating on a Sunday. I gathered the harvest on a Sunday, and I hauled it to my barn on a Sunday. I found that my harvest this October was just as great as any of my neighbors who went to church every Sunday. So where was God all this time? Now that's often our mistake as well, isn't it? Thinking that God should act when and how we want him to act. Our timetable instead of his timetable. And the fact that our vision is limited and finite doesn't really matter. Listen to this reply from the editor of the newspaper, who was obviously a believer. He replied, your mistake was in thinking that God always settles his accounts in October. <laughs> God is going to settle his accounts, but it's not necessarily when you think it's going to happen. So enjoy your barn full of corn for now. Yes. The, the reckoning is still coming, which Solomon, we saw that last week, said that that's still going to happen. So oftentimes we complain, we get frustrated because we can't see the end from the beginning. And we accuse God of being indifferent to us. Basically, we don't live by faith because we think that God's timing doesn't match up with ours. And God, if you had only done this, did Jesus face that? Anybody know the story of Lazarus? Well, the, the Lazarus, his friend. The friend, yes. What was the comment that was made to him by his sisters when he first got there? If only. If you had just been here, 
he wouldn't be in there. But see, they didn't understand God's timing from their own. Now, the reason why Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is so well known is because of this song. And I was trying to hook it up. And again, if you're a, a child of the 60s or 70s, like I was, you would recognize this. And it's the famous Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds. To every season, turn, turn, turn. Like I said, I had it recorded. Now, I'm, I'm not this reason you find out why I don't leave music here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes through a lot of these verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which is why so many people actually know a little piece of scripture from a song that the birds basically just ripped off of scripture and threw some notes to it. But they got it. But you know, there is another song that's also based on this. Because when you read it in the Hebrew, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and a time to give birth, all those, a time to, whatnot, says there's a time for every activity under heaven. Basically it says every, and everything is beautiful in the Hebrew, in its own time. Everything's beautiful. Well, that should remind you of another song. Everything is beautiful in its own way, like a sorry summer night, and so forth. That also is based on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So two artists went in and saw the beauty of this and wrote songs that grabbed the public's attention because of the truth of it. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? God's truth even put to music, can grab people's attention when they, they hear from it. So like I said, this is the people who have never read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, based on those two songs alone in our Western culture, know some of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And now that I've given you the songs, you thought, well, yeah, I, I know those songs. I heard them. I used to sing them. <laughs> when they come on, you know, if you listen to all these... Old, can't say that. Oldies radio, the, the classics, the 70s. Um, you, you hear those songs yet again. I will tell you this, in teaching up at the community college, a lot of my kids that are coming into my class with their earbuds on listening to songs are listening to my generation's music. It has resurfaced all over again for them. And I asked them. What's that? It's in, it, was, it was embedded in video games because the video game, it had run past its time. Same thing with the 40s music. They know 40s music real well. It's embedded into video games because the registration period has run out so they could get it for the cheap, embedded into the games the kids have heard it. And I asked a couple of them, why, you know, what do you like about it? I said, you can understand the words and you can sing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Yeah. So, with that, let's kind of look in. Let's open up our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 3. And I need a good, strong reader because it's a big bunch. Verses 1 through 15. This is the whole poem of a time for. Okay. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill. Hold on, right there. Now, how many of you are already doing the song in your head as you're listening oh, to this? Yeah. Okay, keep yeah. going. <laughs> okay, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on, all, on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, 
People cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things happen over and over again. Well, again, as she was reading that, I know I, I was watching you. And so many of you were doing the song in your head <laughs> as you were reading through that. That's how impactful music can be in our lives. But the word season there comes from a word, from a verb that means to be fixed. And I, that doesn't mean fixed like taking your dog to the vet. This means to be put in place permanently. To be fixed in time. So the word season there, there is a season or there is a time, means God has fixed it there. And what do we see? We see that God, that life is made up of, and it, all of these are comparatives, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A time to mend, a time to, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to be born, a time to die. They're all back and forth. Life is made up of joy and sorrow, building and destroying, living and dying. We see some of that right here in Levine, and for a long time, Levinites like the Cheatums, we're watching old homes that we all had names for being destroyed. The fields that we saw doing alfalfa, corn, and cotton in season, gone. And chicken wire and stucco and towel roofs replacing them. But God has fixed all the events of life. That should actually be comforting. Nothing is a surprise. God has placed it there. He has fixed it into time. This reminds us, though, that we are creatures of time, and currently we are unable to take hold of the joys of eternity. I can't enjoy eternity right now because I am trapped in time. No one can really experience happiness that really hasn't come to grip with the reality that life is full of changes. That life is full of sorrows. I can't experience happiness until I understand that this too is a part of life. It is a normal part of everybody's life. Nobody can name me one person that hasn't experienced loss. That hasn't experienced bad things, as we term them, happen to them. That hasn't had change fostered on them. The old people, the old saying, people hate change, is not true. People hate being changed. People hate being forced to change. People will change like that if they think it's in their best interest. They will change it, and you'll be just shocked, going, what? They're doing what? They're not doing what? If they think it's in their, but if they're forced to change? Ah. Ever tried to put a dog into a bathtub? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're... You're forcing. But change, you, you cannot understand happiness until you understand that all of that is a normal part of everything as well. Now that poem that, that Beth Ann read for us, I think if you wanted to give it a title, you could title it Life Under Heaven. <laughs> life Under Heaven. And then it describes our entire life. And you can go through there, you can go through that whole list, and some of you that are my age or a little bit older, I know there's a couple people in here that are older than me. 
Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> can look down and you could put a check mark by every one of those couplets. <clears throat> yep, done that, yep, done that, yep, done that, yep, done that. Yep. Or if not, you're in the you're in the midst of one of them. And these 14 pairs of contrast really tell us that we have to accept the fact that we are mortal and we are currently governed by time. Because every one of those things are ha ha either have happened to us or are we're in the midst of happening or are about to happen to us. And they're temporary. Yeah, but they are temporary. They all change back and forth because God has fixed everything into its place. Nothing happens accidentally. Nothing takes God, I don't know how many times this is, nothing takes God by surprise. He has fixed it in place. And of course we know from Romans 8, 28 and other passages, the two passages we read last week, what are all those fixed points for? Are good. Although at times they hurt. <laughs> Wisdom is knowing to do the right thing at the right time. Yeah, I'm hitting that again because I want to drive this in to your memory. Wisdom is knowing to do the right thing at the right time. Because you can do the right thing at the right at the wrong time. Now, how does it turn out, folks? <laughs> you can say the right thing at the wrong time. How does it turn out? What you notice, though, in reading over that entire list is that many, and especially birth and death, are in many of these things are entirely outside of our control. You cannot control when you were born. That wasn't up to you, was it? We weren't born at the wrong time. Nope. You also cannot control... When you're going to die. God says, I've got that number all set. That also is fixed. What you notice, what we will see is that Solomon had come to understand that nothing in this world is ours forever. Either the good things or the bad. And what do we focus on? The bad. The bad. <clears throat> but how many of the bad things last forever? None of them. How many of the good things last forever? None of them. None of them. And Solomon came to realize that we can't hold on to either of them. Let's look at just a couple of these a little bit. Because again, this is such a well-known passage due to those, those two songs. Verse 3, a time to kill has to do with, again, you have to get into the Hebrew and, and all this stuff, and I'm not going to drag you through, through the waters on that, but it has to do with execution as opposed to just general killing. But there's a time to do that, although some argue that it also means war as well. That, God has fixed that into place. There's a time for that. And there's a time to move away from that. Verse 6. A time to search and a time to count as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Wow. Um, <laughs> verse 6 reminds us that there's time to let things go. Physical stuff, for sure. And if you want to have a fun marriage, have one of you be a saver, and one of you be a throwawayer. <laughs> oh, are you in for some fun life together? We need to say this, 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 this. this. Why? <laughs> And then the, the throw away, or ah, throw away. And then, of course, six months later, oh, man, I need that. Well, we threw it away six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, since my wife's in heaven, now I can say this. 
brave man. <laughs> I'd go out in the garbage and get my old sweats and bring them back in the house and put them on. I even had a duct tape where some of the holes were. <laughs> but I love those. <laughs> yeah. But it's also amazing that sometimes, and I won't say this happens in my household, <laughs> but sometimes one person's stuff is junk and the other person's stuff is valuable. <laughs> I know that I've had shirts that I really, really liked. And I went to go find it again and put it on. And I said, I can't find my so-and-so shirt. What happened to it? You threw it away. I said, I would not. She said, oh, yeah, you threw it away about two weeks ago. Yeah. Now it was covered with gravy and a bunch of other stuff, but you're the one who took it and threw it in the garbage. Of course, I had no idea it was underneath the... <laughs> 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 That's right. You clean out the refrigerator when you throw it away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there is time to get rid, to remove stuff. Now, that's, I'm talking physical stuff there, but is there also a time to get rid of the hurts that somebody else has fostered on you? The bad things that somebody has done to you, is there a time to throw that away? Yes, yes. But that stuff becomes very difficult to throw away, doesn't it? I like to hold on to that. They hurt me because anger is a power emotion. Mm -hmm. Anger gives you energy. But Solomon said, you know, there's a time to get rid of that. There's a time to take stock in your life and say, you know what? I'm throwing that out with my old shirt. Mm -hmm. The wise person knows when to exert his energy in improving his fortune and when to hold back and take failures without a useless struggle and continuing to beat your head against. You know what? There's time when you just have to take the loss. And say, yep. Yep. I didn't win that one. Okay. Because again, in this list of timing, what if, what if all this lasts forever? None of it. The wins don't last forever. The losses don't last forever. Although the Green Bay Packers, and I can't wait to tease the pastor about it, are going to be thinking about that last four seconds all season long. <laughs> yeah. Loss, too, though, is sometimes gain. Sometimes when we lose, we gain. As when Jesus' departure in the flesh was the prelude for the sending of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' physical loss that incredible beating, the death on the cross, was for our gain. Because that was the prelude for the coming. He said, what will come after I will, who will, the comforter will come? John 16, 7. And there are all kinds of things that we don't know the real value of until they are well beyond our grasp. That loss that happened to me, that bad thing that happened to me was such a gain for me. But at the time, all I did was hurt and complain because I took that loss. And now, years later, I can see, oh, oh yeah, this is why. I've told you all about, you know, and I'm not going to go over that story again, but the death of our third daughter. Big loss, big pain. Hardest thing I've ever done was carry a casket this big. But the gain that God gave me out of that has continued to ripple through my life and Cindy's life to this day. And the gain that we've been able to put into other people's lives because God took us through that. So even the loss, sometimes, and God doesn't always, God doesn't always show us that the loss was our gain either. In that particular case, in my life, he was able to show me, okay, yeah, you're going through loss, but I'm going to show you the gain come down the way. Verse 7. There are times, verse 7, a time to search and a time to count, or, or excuse me, uh, a time to tear and a time to sow. This is for Cindy. 
A time to be silent and a time to speak. This one's for me. <laughs> there are times when it's natural to tear clothes, and particularly in their culture, whether from grief or <coughs> anger or any other cause, such as the clothes being old and worthless, and now they're going to be a good cleaning rag. <laughs> So we're going to tear this up and we're going to, you know, use this as a cleaning rag. There are times for that. Or if the clothing's become infected with stuff or messed up. I, I messed up a shirt. I left a pen in my pocket. It's one of, one of the shirts Cindy had made for me. Got this nice ink stain on it. And she went on Laundry Love and Cleaning Science website. We tried everything. Finally got most of it out, but faded the rest of the stuff out in the process. Ruined the shirt. There was a time to cut that up and say, we're done. Did it applique over the stain? Well, it was kind of like right here, half off, you know, the shirt pocket, half where I kept my pins. Yeah. Buy, so, you know, that, that wasn't going to work. No, no, cousin, no. But notice that, that con the contrast of tearing up clothing and sewing clothing is contrasted with speaking and remaining quiet. Silence is often golden. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool is considered wise if he keeps silent and is considered to be discerning when he seals his lips. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just go, mm. On the other hand, wise counsel is of infinite value and must not be withheld at the right moment. Proverbs 15, 23. A word in due season. How good is it? When you get that word in good season. My father-in-law passed away a couple years ago. Miss him terribly. Not as much as my wife does. It was her dad. <laughs> Miss him terribly, though, because he was a great one for a word in good season. And particularly when I was a young man, early marriage, early, early fatherhood. And he, a lot of you know he made handmade knives, beautiful works of art knives. Um, sent two kids through college making these knives. But he would call me out to the knife shop. Boy, come on out to the shop. <laughs> Where he would impart to me a word of wisdom. But from time to time, that word of wisdom is, I see how you are raising your kids. I think you're doing a great job. Well. <laughs> I'll float it. Can I cut some steel for you, Bill? Let me polish up some of those knives for you. Let me. <laughs> but that word in good season, how well, so there is a time to speak and a time to be silent. And it's that timing, the knowing the right timing for that, that becomes so critically important. The whole poem ends by saying that there's a time for peace. And of course, perfect peace does not exist on earth, does it? Right now, all of the news is the Ukraine and, and then China talking about Taiwan and, and Iran testing and North Korea testing their missiles and all of this nonsense. Let me back up to verse 8. Verse 8 is, rain, is arranged um, what is called chiastically. Uh, which means it's a structure in which words are repeated in reverse order. Love, hate, war, peace. So it reverses the order that you would normally have them in. Love and hate represent personal feelings, while war and peace are socio-political conditions. But yet, they're also very personal. Because where does war and peace generate out of? out of love and hate. Solomon puts them in direct comparison and never denies man's liberty, but he eagerly asserts God's sovereignty, that God is sovereign in all of us. He has fixed 
the word season, all of this in the timing, in his perfect timing. He is sovereign. Now, this is the conundrum that befuddles people time immemorial. It befuddled Solomon. It befuddles us today. Our great theologians, the great guys that write these phenomenal books that we all study and look at, that understand scripture and Hebrew and Greek and nuances and stuff far beyond the rest of us, are actually a bit as confused as you are. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> it means you are dead equal with the great theological minds of all time. Man today, theologians of all time, try to understand the truth that both free will, Arminius, Arminianism, and predestination, Calvin, and boy, the, get in a nice argument with a four-point Calvinist, are both true. Not according to the Calvinist. When the church interviewed me for this position, they asked me about this. And I said, I am a very strong Calvinist standing on an Arminius base. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that God has fixed everything in time, and I stand on the fact that I have free will to choose him or to fight against all of this. How do those two work together? You're not God. Don't worry about it. I, I've given up on it. I know that they're both true, and I'm not going to get into the argument. I will not argue with them. Right, I think that's the point. That's not our job. No. Our job is to go tell the public. Absolutely. And if you were at the men's breakfast, you found out what our job was yesterday and how simple it is. I, I always love people who say, boy, I, I need to take a class on how to share my faith. No, you don't. Go to the Bible, look at the blind man. He's got the greatest testimony of all time. I was blind, but now I see, and he did it. Done. Drop the mic. <laughs> no study of theology. Why bad things happen to good people. You know, I was blind. I see. He did it. Done. Now God, it's your business. Now, even though verses 9 through 15 that she read for us are not a formal part of the whole poem, they, they are a reflection on and they kind of give us understanding, the exposition of the poem. They explain it. And St Solomon starts that section right after he writes that beautiful poem, those 14 comparisons, by asking his regular question. What is the permanent gain from everything that I do? Why am I knocking myself out for this? What is the point? What's your famous line said? What's it all about, Alfie? <laughs> <laughs> What's it all about? Yeah, that's a song too. Yeah, that's another song. <laughs> everything in my house devolves into music. You can't have a conversation in my house, particularly if my kids are home, without somebody getting a line from a song. That's just, yeah, that's just the way my house works. He recognizes that the work here is not simply a part of nature, but our work here is actually an affliction from God. Yeah. Our work is part of God's affliction on mankind. You have to understand Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, verses 17 and 19. Here it comes. And he said to Adam, he said to Adam, he said to Adam, not to Eve, not to the person who got in the conversation. He said to Adam, the guy who was there who was supposed to take care of everything, the guy who was standing there watching his wife eat an apple, whatever it was, to see if she would die, there's a husband you want. <laughs> <laughs> and then when she didn't, he said, okay, now I'll take a bite. He says to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice, 
and ate from the tree which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. Painful labor. All the days of your life. No break, folks. There ain't no break here. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will, eat, you will eat the plants of the field. In other words, you're going to have to go work for it. They were in a garden where it just dropped from the trees. I'll eat this, I'll eat this, I'll eat this. Now they got to work for it. Yeah, the problem wasn't the apple, it was the pear on the ground. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You will eat bread by the sweet of your, bat, your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it for you are dust and you will return to dust. So Solomon, who, wise man, you know he had read the writings of Moses. He had read what we call Genesis. And he said, um, work is a punishment from God. And it's going to be difficult the whole time. I can't move past it. But then everything happens when it's appropriate for it to happen. So even though God has made work this travail, this difficult thing, everything that happens, the good stuff and the bad, happens exactly when it's appropriate for it to happen. This is the best time I have fixed it. It's timing. It has been fixed exactly into place. And again, we know from other scriptures that it's fixed in there for what? Why is it there? For our benefit. For our, benefit. <laughs> for our good. So that we may recognize who's sovereign and take the praise where it belongs. If we can accept life as it is, even the, hard part, even the hard parts become bearable. But there's a catch. We feel like aliens in the world of time. We want to be in eternity. We want to be past all this nonsense. We feel the need for ourselves and our work. We want, our, what, we want what we do to be eternal. And yet we are grieved that we are trapped into time. And everything we knew, we know is going to go... Boom. We want to understand our place in the universe against the backdrop of eternity. People are searching for that all over the planet. Why am I here? What is against the backdrop of eternity? What's the big why? God's purposes are outside our realm of control. They're outside our realm of investigation, which leads us with that very nagging sense of alienation and bewilderment in time of why, what's it all about? But then in verses 12 and 13, Solomon tells us to enjoy our life here. And not only that, what does he say that, what, what about is our life? What, what does he call it? You see it there in verse 13? It's a gift of God. He said, enjoy what God has given you. It's your gift. But wait a minute. I buried a kid, but wait a minute. I, back in 08, I lost my house. Not 08, uh, 98, 88. One of those eights. <laughs> Somewhere where there was an eight in the year. I lost my house. I lost everything. Lost my house, lost my car, lost everything. Lost my job, the whole bit. That was the big, you, you, those of you again that are old enough to remember when they changed, got rid of the savings and loans and our economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. I lost everything. Lost it all. We moved into a rental house. Which then said he had me repaint the whole thing, put down new floors, <laughs> build a garden, da da da. So she, you know, still made it a beautiful living place. And those who've been in my home realize that I am surrounded by beauty all the time. Thank you to my, my wife. I, we had some folks drop in, some old neighbors, just Hi, we're passing by. We're going to stop by and see you. So, come on in. And I've told Sydney this numerous times. I have no problem with 
people dropping over because she ensures that I live surrounded in beauty. His conclusion, he said, and Solomon said, enjoy life. This is what God's given you. So enjoy it. The good stuff, the bad stuff, all of it. And his conclusion in verses 14 and 15 is that the eternal perfection of God's work pretty much overtakes um, all human endeavors. And it completely mocks the human aspiration, the human drive to become eternally significant on my own terms. See, that's how we want to be eternally significant, is I want to be eternally significant because I did this. God says, you're going to be eternally significant because of whose son you are, not because of anything you did. Here's how you're going to be eternally significant. And again, Pastor Larson reminded the men yesterday, you're going to be eternally significant when you get to heaven and somebody that you really had no idea how much impact and influence, but because you were living life the way God told you to live it, and you were being kind, and you were telling them the truth of God's word in your life and in your be word, that they're going to walk up to you in heaven and say, hey, thanks. I'm here because you took that effort. And maybe stuff that you know nothing about until you get there and go, wow, you're here? <laughs> of course, they may be looking at you going, wow, you're here? <laughs> no one can alter the fundamental nature of the world, and, and the result will be that people will be in awe of him, because we can't change anything here. And he said, that's what the result is going to be. I'm going to be in awe of the God who created and has fixed everything. Now, the next couple of verses, we're going to read the end of verse 15 again through verse 17. He's going to kind of look at um, corruption and injustice. Somebody want to read just the last sentence of verse 15 and then verses 16 and 17. Go ahead. And God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I thought in my heart, God will bring the judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, time for every deed. Hmm. In this short section, very short, just a couple verses, Solomon briefly considers corruption and injustice. Is that some of the big terms that are being bandied about in our society right now? All the time. But it's really nothing new. If you go back and read your history books, if you're a history person like I am, you realize that discuss discussions of corruption and injustice have been happening as long as people have been alive and talking and breathing and writing. But it really sets up the, that, first, that last line of verse 15, which reads, and God will call the past to account. This sets up those next two verses that speak to corruption and oppression. And like the rest of us, he doesn't understand why has God allowed this to happen? I was reading another article today, and those of you who have been in my class for a while remember a couple years ago, we looked at the seven big questions that are out there. And one of those is, why does bad stuff happen to good people? And people continue to ask that all the time. Of course, you have to redefine what is a good person and what is bad stuff. In view of the injustice that prevails in earthly courts, Solomon takes comfort in the thought that there is a retribution in store for everyone and that God is going to judge appropriately. So he looks around and says that even though man doesn't get it right, and in man's judgment... In man's running of governments and dealing with people, he doesn't get it right. He says, you know what? God is going to eventually take care and the, everything is going to be recompensed exactly where it's supposed to be. But again, what do we do with timing? When do we want that to happen? Now. Right. now. Yeah, yeah, yesterday. I want it to happen 
God is a righteous judge, strong and patient, and his decisions are infallible. Never wrong. Exactly perfect. Exactly on time. Now, future judgment is what is plainly in view here. And we're going to see when we get to the end of the book that it's also in view there in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verse 14, the very last chapter, the very last uh, verse of the book. It says, For God will bring every act to judgment, including, including every hidden thing, every hidden thing, whether good or evil. So Solomon looks at it and says, even though there is corruption and injustice, there has always been corruption and injustice. Now, does that mean we don't work to make it as good as we possibly can? Of course we do. But he said, I know that that time is finally, the balance sheets are going to be balanced. It's going to be done. And he could take comfort in that. Then he ends the chapter with a treatise on death. So get, let me get one more reader and verse, read verses 18 to 22. So yeah, now we're, now we're going to go to the happy concept of death. <laughs> 18 to 22, go ahead. I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all return to dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth? So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Wow. So God desires people to see that they are in some sense like animals. And in this section, he makes four assertions. And I just gave you the first one. So he makes four assertions in this section. The first one being that God desires people to see they are in some sense some sense like animals. And what is that? What is the comparison to animals that we just read? They die. They die? We die. we die. No difference. Now he's going to draw some differences past that. And in that same concept, then, the second assertion that he says is that people and animals share the same fate dust to dust. Man has no superiority over animals in regards to the law of death. So again, there's a correct time for everything. In my household, in the last 18 months, we've lost two of our three dogs. The two golden retrievers, the mom and the daughter. Um, very painful. Because if any of you have pets, they become a part of your life. They are a part of your household. Um, the golden retrievers really was my youngest daughter, big thing. When the mom died, Addie drove, she's, of course, she's my harpist over in Riverside. And what do you want to do? You know, the, the, I said, I'm, I'm coming home. Four and a half hour drive. So Jane laid there in our family room, right where she dropped for about five, six hours. Hey. Ten, until Addie could get her stuff together and drive home and say goodbye to her dog. But he sees that we have that same fate. And his third assertion then, based on those first two, is that nobody knows from human investigation purpose, we can go into scripture and get some answers, but just from human investigation, nobody knows if the spirit of a human rises at death while that of an animal descends to the earth. You can't scientifically, 
from human investigation figure any of that out? Just, in fact, is from a strictly science base, what does it look like? Same. Exactly the same. same. No difference. The principle of life in both is identical, and its cessation is identical. And what becomes of the spirit in either case, neither the eye nor the mind can discover. And the distinction which reason or religion assumes, that man's spirit goes upward, uh, to its maker and the animals downward, is incapable of proof. And it's beyond anyone's experience. And so what was his conclusion from that? It's the same conclusion that you're going to see that he's come to again and again. His fourth assertion. If all of this is true, we ought to enjoy the life we have here while we have it. And notice that there's no caveat about if you happen to have a million dollars in the bank, and all the health and wealth that you can muster or anything in or you know living in the streets or anything in between he said enjoy what god this is god's gift and enjoy what god has given you now so again the book what is the book asserting that we're mortal that this is temporary. In biblical Christianity, death is constantly described as a curse or an enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, and again at the end of the chapter in verses 54 and 55. Revelation 20, 14. Death is a curse. Death is um, an enemy. And the Bible asserts that again and again. The resurrection of Jesus, though, conquered death, opened the way for the resurrection of the whole person, body and soul, to eternal, to inner immortality by God's power. All of a sudden, we have that eternal significance, but it's not because we worked, we strive, we did anything else. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. And all of a sudden, we have eternal significance based on what somebody else did. And everybody wants to have eternal significance based on what? What they did. What I've done. I think we can really see two conclusions from the fact that we're mortal. The first one. These are, when, you, when, when I present these, you're going to go, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> The first one, neither possessions nor accomplishments are eternal. I love the old saying that you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul. No. <laughs> or a trailer hitch. Or a, or a trailer hitch, yeah. Although the pharaohs tried it, you know, now all that, we've dug it up and it's in museums. It didn't go with them. And we should properly use and enjoy them while we still see daylight. Key or underline the word properly. What is proper enjoyment in the life of a Christian with stuff? What is it? This is, this is, a, this is class participation. Oh. What is proper use? Use it for the glory of God. Sharing it with others. Don't let the stuff become your idol. The stuff doesn't control me. Right. All of that. The proper use. Because it's not eternal. And the second thing is because we are by nature dependent and contingent. Our life is contingent on God giving us our next breath. Is it not? Yes. yes. Book of Job. Our hope of eternal life has to be founded in God and not in ourselves. There's not a thing I can do to give me eternal life. But boy, are there a bunch of religions that have people chasing their tails, trying to earn it. One of them's called medicine. <laughs> 
trying to earn eternal life by doing this and this. I, 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 you know that I worked with the Muslims for years. I, I set up the very first Muslim advisory board to the police in the United States, right here in Phoenix, right here in River City. Another song, sorry. Right. <laughs> See, I told you, everything devolves to a song. Uh, that religion, the religion of Islam, the religion of peace, is all about working and earning. And when you really talk to a Muslim that understands their religion well, because I knew all the imams in the valley real well. And you remember back in the uh, oh, early 2000s, there was the famous st the story of the flying imams, the, the imams, were, and they went to, it was prayer time, they prayed, and they refused to get on an airplane. The, the flight said, oh no, we saw these guys get out rugs and start praying, and a few years after 9-11, and so, you know, Muslims scare everywhere. I knew all those Muslims, personally, still know them. But when you talk to them, they have absolutely no assurance that Allah will grant them paradise. They have hope that if they, and they believe that if they do all of this, that Allah being the gracious God that he is, that then he will grant me paradise because I've done it. But they, when you ask them, do you know if you've made cross the line? They will honestly tell you, I do not. I, I can't live like that. <clears throat> Our hope of eternal life has to be founded in God and not ourselves. These are the two big conclusions from the fact that we're mortal. Nothing we have here is eternal. Good stuff, bad stuff. And because I'm contingent and dependent, my hope is on somebody else who's made it happen. Mm -hmm. Now look at Solomon's conclusion. Where am I at time-wise? Oh, good. His conclusion, and this is the part, this is the part that I want to, here's where I tee it up. I'm playing T-ball. I want to try to knock this thing out of the park. Here's the thing. If the rest of this has been funny, we've told a couple of jokes, and I've made some musical references that you remember, great. If you remember nothing else, remember this part. His conclusion is that things being what they are, a person should ad adopt a view of his personal existence which allows him to enjoy fully, to enjoy fully, the small pleasures and satisfactions of earthly existence. Would that be amazing in your life right there? Yes. To just say, I serve an awesome God and whatever's on my plate today, I'm enjoying this. Because this too is a gift of God. Now, can you rejoice always and again I say rejoice see Solomon was just teaching something that was going to be written in the New Testament years later but he was giving us the practical how to because when you read that in the New Testament you go there tastes pastor I just can't rejoice my wife died five years ago I can't rejoice right now yeah you can particularly if she's a believer, <laughs> you know where she's at. Because I'm going to enjoy that gift of God that he's given me right now because it's that gift. There's no mountaintop that allows us to fully see the future beyond this earthly existence. The Bible gives us a few very vague glimpses while promising that it is so great beyond our capacity to understand. You can study all the passages on heaven and all you're going to be left with is and again I've read several of the great theologians that have really studied this stuff and parsed out words and whatnot. All I'm convinced of is that heaven's just going to be wow. But beyond that I have no idea. Really. None. Zip. But not only is the future hidden from us but the present, the right now, leaves us baffled. 
Does it not? Yes. Can, can y'all nod? That there are days you just go, I don't get it. So we are left with trusting God for the future and living now, living right now with everything that's right now. And I have no idea what's going on in your life right now. When I say I don't care, it doesn't mean I don't care because I care deeply about all of you. That's why I'm in this position. But I don't care in the fact that God wants this. He has fixed this into time, whatever you are going through right now. And I want you to enjoy it and say, I rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And what is that? Really, you took it down to a single word and I put it on the screen. Contentment. What? Without going with a show of hands, who could use a little more contentment in their life? And if you think, yes, I'm a very content person, <laughs> we'll sit down and we'll ask, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Because we could all use a little contentment. That's what Solomon has drawn our attention to here in chapter 3, is I want you to enjoy what God has given you because like an animal, you are going away from here and this is temporary. Is this good news? Yes. Is Ecclesiastes the downer that you thought it was going to be from maybe a brief reading that you heard once or when you did your reading through the Bible in a year and you, you, know, you blew right through the book of Ecclesiastes and say, this is, this is awful, I'm not coming back here. <laughs> but see when you stop and listen to what God wrote through this man you realize wait a minute this is good stuff I can walk out of here right into the midst of what the world says is nonsense and garbage and pain and stupid employees and bad neighbors and a dead dog in my living room and all the other things <laughs> and go I, this, God has fixed this, and there's a time for everything, and right now, this is the time for that. But God has it fixed for me. Good news? Good news. Pastor Larson, would you close us? Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Help us to see life from your point of view. Thank you. Oh, I pray that all of us will be people of praise and gratitude and thanksgiving. Just enjoying where we are, what you're doing in our lives. And we see the pain and sorrow and suffering of friends all around us. But thank you for the truth. And most of all, for the incredible hope that we have. That Lord, absent from the body is at home with the Lord. And we've got so much to live for. Help us make every day count in the light of eternity. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Next week, chapter four, if you want to read ahead.